Well, good morning, Church of the City Spring Hill family. My name is Derek Barman. I'm one of the pastors at Church of the City Spring Hill. It's so great to be with you. And I have my lovely wife with I'm us today, too. Courtney yes. Barman. Yes, and I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, we're, we're grateful to be joining you in your homes again. Uh, and uh, today is a special day because it, this is the beginning of Holy Week. Today is Palm Sunday, so we recognize that. And uh, we're excited to start this week off together virtually again. Remember, we're using the phrase, we're, we're physically distancing, but we are still socially and spiritually connecting. And one of the highlights of last Sunday was connecting online with you through the hashtag C-O-T-C at home. It just lifted my spirits and, and knowing that like, yeah. like we're all in this together, there's something powerful in that. Absolutely, connecting online, um, what, a, what a time we live in where we can actually stay connected. And this is a great time to do that as you're watching the service. Feel free to, to say hi, to welcome. If you have a prayer requ request even, um, feel free to, to drop that in. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I, I want to encourage you as well, as we engage online, to engage in the activities that we are that we're doing. Uh, one of the tenets for us every Sunday is to worship our Heavenly Father. And so we're going to start again this morning by worshiping together. So I know this might be new or unique for you to do this in your home. I want to invite you to stand right now. And uh, as we sing these songs, yeah. to, to sing them out loud. There was a couple moments last week where you uh, may have been the only one. I may singing. have been the only one singing. And you probably are the only one who maybe shouldn't be singing. That's true. <laughs> but that's okay. But this is, that's the beauty of worship. It's the beauty. Absolutely. Yeah, it's so. not about how great we sound or if we always feel comfortable. And, no, no. And so we want to invite you into that again uh, today. So if you would stand up and we're just going to, we're going to stop for a moment. Yeah. And uh, we're going to close our eyes. And we're going to take a breath. We're going to breathe in. And let's center ourselves in prayer uh, this morning. Father, we come to you and uh, we believe that you are worthy of our worship. That you are worthy of our voices singing to you, our hands raised to you. You are worthy of that, Lord. And, uh, and you are pleased when we do this. Even if we, we aren't on key, uh, even if we, it, it might not be the, the greatest skill set we possess, um, just singing, just our voices singing out to you. Um, is, is a gift, and, and we thank you for the opportunity we have to do that together this morning. And so, Father, we uh, recognize that you are the object of our affection, and we worship you with our soul, with our mind, with our body, and with our spirit. We love you, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
trembles at his voice yes it trembles at his voice how great is our God won't you sing with me how great is our God and all will see how great how great is our God
is our God. Won't you sing with me how great is our God? And all will see how great, just how great is our God. One more time, let's sing how great he is, how great. Is our God, and all will see how great, just how great is our undeniable God. Good morning, friends. My name is Jen Smith, and I have the honor of serving as one of our pastors at Church of the City Spring Hill. Normally at this time, I would welcome you, but I want to take this moment this morning to say thank you for inviting us into your home. We're so glad to be with you. I wish that we were there in person so we could stay for lunch, but we'll take whatever we can get. I have absolutely loved the photos that you've been posting with the hashtag COTC at home. I encourage you to keep posting those photos. I love when we scroll through on Sunday mornings. It almost feels like an unofficial parade of homes. The unique part of this season is that most Sundays when we walk into a church building, we find our families going in different directions, to Kid City, to City Students, to the auditorium. It's been beautiful to see families worshiping together, learning together, taking communion together. I feel like I have had a front row seat as I watch my kids engage with Kids City videos, seeing them worship in our living room, seeing our little guy who's three get excited about Ollie and watching our middle schooler engage with city students online. We are going to keep offering these resources and so thank you for utilizing them to stay connected. We talk often about how Sunday mornings are an overflow of what happens the rest of the week. And it's been a joy to hear about how you are being the church Monday through Saturday, meeting needs, connecting with each other. Our missional communities continue to meet throughout the week through virtual means and a huge shout out to our leaders who have led the way in this. As our established groups continue to meet, we are going to be launching some new virtual groups. And if you've not connected yet, this might be the perfect moment for you. You can connect without leaving the comfort of your own home. In this time of physical distancing, social connection is vital. We are lifelines for each other as we process what we're going through, encourage one another, bring each other to the truth of God's word, pray for one another, and help meet each other's needs. If you would be interested in leading or in connecting through a virtual group, please email me at jennifer.smith at churchofthecity.com. I would love to help you connect. I also want to extend an invitation to Celebrate Recovery that is online through Facebook every Tuesday evening at 6.30 p.m. They have worship and teaching. You can like their Facebook page, COTC Spring Hill Celebrate Recovery, for more information. As we now move towards talking about giving and care, I want to take a look at the early church. We read in Acts chapter 4 about how the early church was being pressed, told that they could not even teach in the name of Jesus. And when it might have felt easy or even safe to hide, to turn inward, to look out for only themselves, Scripture says that the church was one in heart and soul and they continued to meet the needs of one another. Church, we celebrate you and how you have done this. The ways that you have stepped into this moment, it truly has been one of our finest hours. As we have loved one another, as we have continued to be generous with one another. Light comes into the darkness when we operate out of a mentality of generosity rather than scarcity. When we carry ourselves with a non-anxious presence instead of fear. Thank you 
for doing these things. And thank you for using our online platforms to continue giving. You can do this this morning at churchofthecity.com give. When you give your tithes and your offering, you can designate them to Spring Hill. Thank you for continuing to trust God with your giving. Let's pray over this offering. Lord, I thank you that you are a God of generosity. I thank you that we can learn to love well because you first loved us well. And we pray over this offering that it would bring your kingdom into this world and that you would use it to serve not only our church family, but our community and our world. Lord, we thank you that in the difficult moments, your goodness and your faithfulness remains, for you never change. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The last thing that I would love to share with you this morning is about our care ministry. We recognize that in this time, people are finding themselves in situations they've never been in before, maybe laid off for, from a job or with minimal work hours experiencing needs that they haven't experienced before. Church of the City has created an online platform at churchofthecity.com care. And when you go to this link, you're gonna find three options, to provide care, to receive care, and to give. We have this unique opportunity right now to step into care. And what this looks like is perhaps you're a business owner or a manager and you have jobs opportunities for people. You can share those. Or maybe you'd be willing to help from your experience in a particular field like mental health or counseling. Or maybe you want to help senior adults as they have needs. You can click on that provide care. If you have availability to provide care in some way, we would love to hear from you. You can also give financially towards the care and benevolence that's directly related to COVID-19 needs. We want to provide tools and resources and help for everyone who's in need. And this morning, if you find yourself with a need, we want to be here for you. This can look like very tangible needs like groceries or bills or childcare. It can also look like intangible needs like counseling or first responder support or prayer. Completing that form, churchofthecity.com slash care will connect you with a pastor and we will do our very best to help you. Now this morning, we're gonna continue with our series portrait and Pastor Derek and his wife, Courtney, will be teaching from Jesus's I am statement, I am the true vine. Every week we've introduced you by video to the artwork for that week and so this morning, I have the pleasure of introducing you to Jesus as the true vine. excited to share with you today. Courtney and I get to teach together, which we don't get to do often. No, but, it's very exciting. And we're going to have some fun with this today. Yeah. So I hope you guys are ready to have some fun. I think in this season, joy, laughter, smiling is really important. So yeah, it's an undervalued resource right yeah. now. Yeah. So we're going to hang out in John chapter 15 today. If you have your Bibles in, you know, uh, I'd encourage you to grab those right now. We'll have the scripture on the screen as well, but there's something really important about having your Bible and making notes uh, as you go. One thing to note before we read the scripture today is that this, this text is really personal to us. When, yeah. when we moved to Middle Tennessee, summer of 2016, our, one of our mentors challenged us, he encouraged us. He said, hey, uh, I encourage you to, to pray about a scripture yeah. that's your anchor scripture for this season of transition. Because he yeah. said, when things get hard, when things get difficult, remember that the Lord is with you. Yeah, not if things get hard, because again, we had like a five month old, a four year old, a seven year old, we're moving across the country. Like we knew that it was going to be hard, but we also knew that this is what God was calling us to do. Yeah. So this was this was coming back to the truth and yeah. coming back. So this is a really, it's really special. Yeah. Us. 
In seasons of difficulty and uncertainty, John chapter 15 was like our anchor text. And I think yeah. that's really interesting and fitting for us today as a, as a community, as a family on mission together. Yeah. This text, I really believe the Lord wants to speak to us. Would you please stand if you are able to in the honor of the reading of God's word. John chapter 15, starting in verse one, Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in me, and if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. This is the word of the Lord, and you may be seated. So that, that text is so rich. There's so much in there. There's, we could spend the next three months looking at everything Jesus says right there. And it's so timely for this season because... Uh, we have a chance to remain, or another word in other translations, the word is abide. Yeah. Remain and abide in him. Many of us have some extra time on our hands. It's a unique season, but many have extra time on their hands. Um, at the same time, we just want to stop before we go any further and recognize there are some that in this season, their, their workload and their life has gotten a little more intense. And um, they, in some ways, they are putting their life on the line. Absolutely. For others. Absolutely. Um, nurses. Nurses, first responders. Yeah. Uh, and, and so we just want to stop for a moment and recognize there are some of you uh, watching right now, some of you worshiping with us right now, some of you have family members that uh, their role is going out and serving the community. They're doctors, nurses, first responders, they're going out. People that work at the grocery store yeah. are going out and serving the community. And so one of the things we wanted to do this morning is pray over you. If, if, you are, if you are going out and you are living out Philippians chapter two, where you're considering others better than yourselves, we wanna pray a prayer of protection over you. I think of some names in our church. We just threw out a list this morning. Kristen Clay, Julie McCarter, Joanne Morris, Lori Berglin, Corey Kurolf, Kate Boltz, Corinne Phillips, Amanda Webb, Amanda Bendit, Stephanie Younger. There's probably so much more, so yeah. many more. Um, but if you guys would as a church, let's, let's stop for a moment this morning and let's lift up those that are putting their lives on the line for us. Let's pray for them. So would you pray for me? Pray with me right now. Father, we come to you and we lift up those that are putting their lives on the line, that are going out. When, when we are asked to stay in, to be wise and to love our neighbor well by staying at home, there are some that don't have that privilege. Um, they, they're going out, they're going into hospitals and they're going into homes where they're caring for others. And uh, we, we lift them up to you right now and we pray that in the name of Jesus, you would protect them. Yeah. We pray that in the name of Jesus, you would go before them, that you would uh, supernaturally protect them from, from harm. And uh, you would encourage them, that their spirit would be encouraged, they would be lifted up as as they live out Philippians chapter two, where, where Paul says, consider others better than yourselves. As, as they do that by serving others and putting others before themselves, we pray 
that you would protect them. We pray that you would protect their families. Yeah. I think of those that after they come back home from the hospital where they have to even be disconnected from their families. I pray an extra protection over their families right. and connection through, through video, through FaceTime, whatever way they're connecting. I pray that you would protect those relationships. We lift them up to you right now, Father, and, and, and we pray that they would feel your presence, that as they, as they do drive into whatever job they have, that they would feel your presence and, and know that you are going before them. Mm -hmm. um, we thank you for them, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yeah, I mean, corporately, we're, we're in a season that if we look at this, um, this passage, it feels like pruning. It feels like we are, we're being cut back a little bit. We have less access to, to things we used to have. Um, we have less ability to, to move around freely. It feels um, really limiting. And, and if you're not familiar with that, that term pruning, um, you know, if, and if you're not a master gardener, you might not be. Um, I'm not. I, I like to think I am. You have friends that are. I have friends that are, so I almost am. Pruning is, is cutting back. It's cutting back with the intention of growing for the f even more full. You know, um, it's, it's to clear or to get rid of, to remove something. And in this verse, when we're, when we're going to talk about it, pruning doesn't come because the gardener, and spoiler alert, God is the gardener, um, because the gardener is mad or angry with, with the branch, Pruning comes with promise. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, pruning comes with a vision of more and of better. And that to me is exciting because in those times where it feels like less, um, for me that always feels a little shaky, it always feels uncertain because I, I like more. I like bigger and better, you know, and so does our culture for the most part. We don't celebrate pruning. We don't generally celebrate less, but this is making room for more. And I, and I love that idea. Yeah. Yeah, so, so in this... In these 17 verses, yeah. Jesus is making sure we understand that, that he's the vine, yeah. that we are the branches, and that God is the gardener. What we need to understand, too, about what he's saying is the context to what he's speaking to right here. Yeah. As, as we look at these verses, we need to understand what is probably going on. At this time, uh, remember in the book of John, these last few chapters is the last week of his life. So, so it's... So interesting because this is Holy Week. This is Holy Week, yeah. yeah. This would be that time. And so he's having these really important connections with his disciples. At this point, there are 11 of them, okay? And they're walking from having this meal together and they're on their way to uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, most scholars would say they'd been, they're walking through the Kidron Valley to get there. Not Kidron Park. Not Kidron Park, a little different than that. And uh, that was good, babe. <laughs> And uh, many scholars would actually say that Jesus is referencing something that his disciples would know about. Yeah. In, in chapter 15, when he's talking about the vine, uh, they would know that, that displayed on the front of the temple was a golden vine with hanging grapes. And it was this idea of, of, of marvel, of size and artistry connected uh, on the temple. And this vine was also used to represent Jerusalem. They would, they would use it on, on coins, and it was made during the first century revolt, and it was a familiar Old Testament image for the nation of Israel. Think of it like this. It's like, um, it's like to the U.S., the, the symbol of the, of the eagle uh, is connected to the United States. The vine would be the symbol for the nation of yeah. Israel, for the Jewish people, and specifically for the temple, for the Israelites there. And so it can be helpful to think of it that way. So Jesus is saying, hey, you know about this vine. Um, you know about this vine. Well, I'd like to present an alternative paradigm. I am the vine, the only authentic and genuine vine. And by taking the image of Israel and applying it to himself, Jesus is asking his disciples to no longer identify themselves by their nationality. It's not just about what you do with the temple and with the Israelites. It is recognizing Jesus is saying, I am the true vine. Yeah, don't just identify yourself as your how you identify with your religious group or with your nationality. I'm going to take all that away. Identify with me. Yeah. Choose me. Yeah. And it's interesting. Jesus says here, he says, I am the true vine, Yeah. which 
helps us understand that there are other vines that we could choose to be a part of. Absolutely. Uh, we could choose to be a part of the religious vine, right. of doing all the duties and what, what church do I go to, what, what denomination right. am I a part of? And, and Jesus is saying, no, I am the true vine. So I think it's important for us to think about what vines have we attached ourselves to? Jesus identifies himself as the true vine. He doesn't claim to be the only option. He just says he is the correct one. Well, and the vine is, is, a, is a source. It's a source of power. It's a source. I mean, that's what the fruit grows from. The branches grow from the vine. Yeah. So when we're talking about that, we're attaching ourselves to, to power, to identity at some level, which yeah, we're going to totally. get to. Um, yeah, I mean, you and I have a story about this a little bit where when we were dating, um, like you mentioned last week, now now I get to share Go a for little it. bit. But um, like you shared last week, we started dating when we were in high school. And um, it was probably my, my first real love. I mean, I would hope for, for both you of too. Us. Yeah. yeah. And um, we, we fell fast and we fell hard, I would say. And to the, to the point where it, we made each other like each other's source, if that makes sense. So rather than us attaching to God, we didn't, we didn't, I didn't have language for that. I won't speak for you. I didn't have language didn't for that. I didn't know what I was doing. And you became my everything. And um, eventually we broke up in college because of that, because it's so much weight to bear to be someone's everything. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I, and, you know, you share that because maybe for some of us, we have attached ourselves to a relationship yeah. where, we, where we find our identity yeah. or where we find our power source. Yeah. And we can do this. We can do this as parents. Oh, absolutely. And finding our absolutely. identity in our kids and our kids um, or the family we're connected to. We can we can do this beyond just relationships. We can do this totally. with jobs. Job I know title, job performance. I, I know. Yeah, I know for myself, like I can I can find it easy to find my identity in what I do because yeah. it's because it's church work, because right. it's pastoring people. Yeah. Um, yeah. We can find our identity in in making all the right decisions and doing all the right things in uh, making sure people look at us and think that we have everything together. Yeah, that can kind of even slide to that religious side, you know, where it's like maybe we identify with that. But when we do that, I don't know if you're going to talk about this. So I'm going to jump ahead. Maybe. Go ahead. But but when we identify with that, then then we either find ourselves being elevated, like I'm doing all the right things, I'm doing all the right things, I feel so good about things, or or f feel so good about myself, or I'm not doing the right things. And there's like the spirit of like condemnation or hopelessness. So we're kind of we're kind of going in between, and we're not living in in a, like a healthy space yeah. day to day. Yeah. There's a writer by the name of Josh Houston. He wrote a book on John 15 called The Abiding Life, which if you have time, highly encourage. If you're one of those people that in this season you have time, have a little extra highly time. encourage you to download this book, The Abiding Life by Josh Houston. He says this, choose your vine and choose it wisely because the fruit of your life will be dependent on who or what is your source. Good. And I think, I think back to, to our story. Yeah. When we were dating, we didn't really, we knew of God but we didn't know him as our source. Oh, no. And so it was almost like our relationship became the source of life. Oh, for sure. And the reason I would say we had to break up was because we could not handle that. I could not handle being your source and you could not handle being my source. We're not created for that. No, I, isn't there, a, you know a quote about that, I forget that, where it's like basically we, we, we weren't meant to be someone's God. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and we were talking about this, kind of rehashing our, our breakup. And um, it wasn't because I d we didn't love each other. Yeah, like, we I love still, each other. I still loved you. I remember sitting in that parking lot, like outside my college apartment, and wanting so bad for this to work, but knowing that it wasn't. Like yeah. knowing that something was off, but I couldn't put my finger on it. And I didn't have language for yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so when Jesus is saying, I am the true vine, he's saying, I, I want to be your power source. Yeah. I want, I, want, I want myself, Jesus is saying, I want myself to be the, the source of power for all that you do engage with. And yeah. I. I feel like that's the gift of the Lord for us is um, in our story, we both came to know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Yeah. He became our true vine. Yeah. Crazy story on that. We should share that one at some point. It was yeah. on the same day, separate. Yeah. We, we were broken up on the same day, January 21st, 2001. We yeah. gave our lives to Jesus. And what was so beautiful is we were able to reconnect. Yeah, but you know what was great too though with that, as we deep dive into our relationship, 
um, we were able to, to kind of find our own footing though too. Yeah. Like we were able to serve, we were able to find our identities separately and then come together. Yeah. Which, which I think for me is, is what I needed yeah. and probably what you needed yeah. too. So. so, so Jesus is saying, I am the true vine and, and I wrote this down. He wants to be our one and only vine, not, not one of many, right. but our one and only. Yeah. And, I, and I think in our faith, this is really important for us, if you're a follower of Jesus, to consider, is Jesus my one and only source of power? Or is he one of many? Right. Um, our, our culture and our society, um, we, we have a tendency to think that we can do it all. Well, I want it all. I, that's me, probably more than you. Because you're <laughs> yeah, like, probably. I don't, I don't yeah. feel that way. I'm like, oh, I do. Yeah. I, one of many or... Let yeah. me do all the things. Yeah. And, and so if, if, we, if we don't want to be limited, we think, well, I got Jesus, but I also have these other things. These right. are also my, yeah. my source. There's an article we came across this week by a guy named Greg McCown. Yeah. He wrote a book called Essentialism. And he, he said, he gave this little uh, background on the word priority. Yeah. The, if you think about the word priority, it came into existence in the English language in the 1400s. And for 500 years, that word was never turned into the plural form. It was always singular. You priority. have a priority. There's only one priority. And he, and he actually says in his study, he found that in the 1900s, we pluralized the term and started talking about priorities. It would, thinking yeah. that we could like, like we could change the word and we could, he says, we could bend reality. Somehow we thought by pluralizing the word, word, word we would now be able to have multiple first things in our lives. And that's not even possible. No, it's like you all get first places. Like it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It's like know? handing out first place trophies to everyone. Like millennials. <laughs> no. <laughs> but we no, don't need to talk, we don't about, need that, to talk about that. Yeah. But that's not, whatever. But yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that it's, it's, it's this idea of it reflects the culture. Yeah. It reflects who we are and what we want. We want many things rather than just picking one thing. Yeah. And, and again, go back to what Jesus says. He says, I am the true vine. He, wa he wants to be our source of power. He wants to be the place we find our identity, not one of many. And I think this is probably why Jesus talks so often about money as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because probably people, we can have a tendency to think our source, our job, and what we own is our place of identity and power. And he's saying, I want to be that source. And and so in John 15, if you followed along, I don't know what version you have, but there's these words, remain and abide. Jesus keeps repeating, yeah. remain, remain in me. me, remain in me, Ab abide in me, abide in me. And so we want to, with the rest of our time together this morning, we want to look at that word abide. What does abiding look like? What does, what does abiding in Jesus look like? We don't use that word often. I can't remember the last time I used that word. Right. Um, and so we want to give some very clear, specific handles. If you're a student watching, I hope middle school students, hopefully even elementary students, yeah. could understand what we're talking about here. So we're going to yeah. talk about the three movements of abiding and what that, that looks like. Okay. Yeah. So the first one, the first one is identity. Recognizing Jesus as your source of identity. If you want to abide in Jesus, you recognize he is your source of identity. Uh, two dangers I've noticed for myself and for others when it comes to identity. Uh, we can tend to find our identity in what we do. There's a tool I want to share with you this morning. Um, it's called the uh, Covenant Kingdom Tool. And a uh, tool given to me by one of my mentors. But it helps me understand this concept of where we find our identity. I'm going to draw a shape this morning. It's a triangle. And the key... For us to find our identity is recognize the source. So I'm going to put identity here. Put obedience here. So if Jesus is the true vine in our lives, we recognize he's our connection to our father, the gardener. And yeah. he is the source of our identity. And when we recognize that our identity comes from our creator, our heavenly father, who if we want, want to know who God is, we look at Jesus, God's son, and we get our, our identity from what he says to be true, 
about us and from our identity, it leads to obedience. Now, if you're like me, if you're like us, at some point in your life, maybe you found yourself doing something to gain your identity, maybe gain a title or whatever that is, so that you get approval yeah. from your creator. I found that as a danger uh, in life, especially like, especially as you follow Jesus for a while and you get in like serving him. It's so easy for us to find our identity in what we do and it, and it goes the, the opposite direction. If I'm good, then people, you know, that'll be my identity. Yeah. I'll serve, I'll do this, and then I'll, I'll get the Father's approval. Yeah. When the Father's approval is there for you and His love is there for you already, yeah. we get to operate out of that rather than trying to earn that. Yeah, and so the, so the key here for us is recognizing the direction from, from what yeah. the Father says, what Jesus says as the gardener and the vine, we gain our identity, it leads yeah. to our obedience. That's, that's the first danger I've, I've find myself falling into. The second one is this, we can find our identity in what other people think about us. Yeah, of, I mean, we all know this. Right. Yeah. It's, it is what it is. There's, a, there's an interesting quote that we saw this week that um, I'm going to say it, probably have to say it twice. Maybe three times. Charles Horton Cooley says this, I am, I am not what I think I am. I am not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I am. A lot of thinking, but again, I am not what I think I am. I am not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I am. This is very simply the idea of we, f we can tend to find our identity in what we think other people think about us. Yeah, um, again, in researching this, researching this this week, um, so often we, we perceive ourselves as how we believe the person that matters most to us perceives us. Mm -hmm. So if that's like a parent that we're never gonna get their approval or their affirmation or a spouse, you know, maybe maybe it's a spouse who loves you no matter what, and that's a beautiful thing. You have this, you have lots of grace, and it's a really healthy relationship. Or maybe there's a, a critical, you know, spirit there. We operate out of that. So when we hear this, this is called mirror theory, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. So when we when we hear this, and when we operate out of that place, it's not even so much how we think about ourselves, or even what you think, because I may not know if I'm operating out of a spot where, um, you know, what does Derek think about me? I may not know. But I, th I can think that I know, mm -hmm. and I can act out of that. It, it is super dangerous to, oh, yeah, to find our identity in what we think other people think about us. I mean, this is, this is quintessential social media culture right now where absolutely. what people think about, what we think they think about who we are by what we post. Um, super mm -hmm. dangerous place to find our identity. Jesus, here's what we want you to hear on this. Jesus, when he says, I am the true vine, he's saying, find my identity Find your identity in me. Yeah. I am the vine. My father is the gardener. And, and that's where it starts to understand he is the source, yeah. not what other people say, right. not what I think they think about me, right. and, not from, and not from what I do. Yeah, and this is where hiding scripture away in your heart so really matters. Yeah. Where it matters elevating God's opinion in place in your life rather than um, operating out of man's approval, if that makes sense. If, if we truly love God and we, we are operating out of a spot of where we want to be, we want to be obedient, not because we have to earn it, but we want to be obedient because of our love for him, then that changes everything. That changes how we operate. And again, having that scripture to, to know the truth about his promises and his hope and his love for us, that changes how, how we live our life. Yeah. Yeah. It's huge. Yeah. So as I look through this passage, like Derek said, we hear this word abide. Um, you know, right now it feels like we're abiding in our homes, right? We are, we are staying in our homes. We are, um, we're living, we're, we're tolerating, we're putting up with, we are, we're accepting that that's our reality. We're choosing that at some level. And that's what we're called to in this scripture. We're, we're called to choose to be connected. Um, and, and if I'm being honest, I think part of why the scripture um, matters to me a lot is is because I, I don't come by abiding naturally. Um, I like to abide in my own strength. I don't like to to depend on a good gardener. If I'm being, that's like 100% honest. I wouldn't say that to you the first time we met. But, um, but I, I would prefer being in my own strength. 
I would prefer operating independently. And so it takes me choosing to abide, choosing to stay connected and to believe the truth. Again, that's where for me, scripture has been huge in practicing um, abiding. And even, even when it doesn't go well, coming back and trying again to abide. And you've been sharing, so we have, we talked about, we have these things called COTC dailies right now. Yeah. Um, they're just morning devotionals, five to seven minutes, where we go through the SOAP method, mm -hmm. scripture, observation, application, and prayer yeah. through the scripture. And you found that, that those times have been really beneficial for you. Oh yeah, absolutely. I love, I, I mean, I don't know if you've been doing it, but I love when there's a guided moment. And so I get to, I get to abide with someone else and they get to lead me through that. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a second, but it's been so beneficial just to stop and pause. Um, in this season especially. I think that's been really, really good for my soul. Yeah, that's good. All right, so that's the first movement, identity. The second movement is, actually, let's have you guys do this. I'm, I'm gonna say the word and I want you to repeat it back. We might not hear you, but I'm gonna trust you're with us on this. First one is identity. Everyone say identity. All right. Great. The second movement is intimacy. Everyone say intimacy. All, all the kids in the house, intimacy. There we go. Okay. <laughs> There we go. So the, the main piece to intimacy for us today is this. Um, there, there's a book out there by a guy named Gary Thomas. Another good read if you have some time on your hands. It's called Sacred Pathways. And he talks about nine different types of connections, people that can connect with God, nine different pathways to connect with God. And, and really the whole idea behind this book is just getting to this, this thought that uh, each of us has a different way of having intimacy with our Creator, with our Heavenly Father, with, with Jesus as the vine and our Heavenly Father as the gardener. Can you explain intimacy when you say that? Because people hear that and like, I laugh, I get silly. But what, what, you, what we were talking about is, is really like, the, like a, re, a ease of relationship, a closeness, yeah. kind of the feel in the flow. So I'm gonna give examples to explain oh, what intimacy great. looks like. Hopefully Sorry. this helps out. No, that's good. Okay. So um, some of you uh, might connect the best with God and with Jesus as your vine when you're actually in his creation. When you get outside, when you go on a hike with six feet apart from everyone, when you are engaging in beautiful views of mountains or, or the fog coming like Zion in. National or, or yeah, Zion National Park. Zion National Park or yeah. the Smokies, you yeah. know, like, like when you just see the beauty of God's creation, that's a connection you have with him. Yeah. That, that would be intimacy. Yeah. I, another one which yeah. I was gonna mention is yeah. uh, uh, Gary Thomas talks about ascetics, and that's a type of person that connects to God through solitude and simplicity. You and, think this would be you probably, right? And I feel like that's a very yeah. strong one for me, like solitude for me when I can get up before anybody else in our family yeah. gets up in the morning and I have that time, coffee, Bible, journal, yeah. super simple, I have I, I feel like that is like tapping into my power source. When we talk yeah. about Jesus being the true vine, when I do that in the morning, I am a, I'm a better dad. I'm a better husband. I can yeah. tell the days when I've had yeah. that time, that intimacy with Jesus. I'm, I, I have more patience. I can too. And kindness. You can tell. <laughs> I can tell. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And so that, that's it. So um, there's, here's a few others. If you connect best with God um, when you're learning or, or reading a new book or reading scripture, Maybe just recognize that that's yeah. a connection for you. Maybe, maybe you connect best with God when you serve others. I think about a lot of friends when I read that one because I think there there are those caregivers who who are truly connecting with God when they love others. Yeah. And I and I'm fortunate enough to have some of those people in yeah. my life. Yeah. I, I have a friend who, or we have a friend who, just this week, uh, I think this is him because he found out we could not find paper towel anywhere, and he had nine. A, nine pack of paper towel and drove over to our house yeah. and dropped it off. Yep. And I just got a text later saying, hey, you have paper towel. <laughs> yeah. And just very simple yep. things like that, like yep. caring for others is a connection Absolutely. to God. Maybe for you it's worship music and time alone with Jesus. Like if that, whatever that is, I'd encourage you, maybe just you can Google sacred pathways. You can see yeah. the nine different types, read about them and and you probably know what that is for you. Yeah, and if you're into the Enneagram, it's interesting that this is nine and that, and that would be nine. And you can kind of have a discussion about that. I see that there's one that loves God through the senses, with their senses. That's probably more of my, my style, maybe. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's kind of an interesting look if you guys wanna do that. Anything else on intimacy? Yeah, absolutely. Anything else so, you wanna share? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I've been, like Derek said, I've been enjoying the COTC daily 
um, devotion. I, I, I really have. That's been a just like a non-negotiable in my day. And as I have been doing that, I've been loving the observation piece. I have been doing what Christy McClellan, um, what I'm trying, I'm trying to do my best Christy impression and let the scripture read me, essentially. And when I read this scripture, um, what, what it stands out to me about it is, is the love that God has for us. You know, he, Jesus is talking about this where he says, love each other as I've loved you. Greater love has no, no one other than this to lay down one's life for one's friend. You are my friends, do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friend for everything that I have learned from my father, I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so whatever you ask in the name of the father will be given to you. This is my command to love one another. To me, I, I read this and I, I see this outpouring of, of love. I see how Jesus loved his disciples. Um, I don't know if you've ever had a really great coach or somebody who has taught you something and loved you well, and you've maybe turned that corner to where you were no longer just a player or just a team member, but you guys were friends. There's this deep bond and connection. I think of our staff team like yeah. this, and um, we were led by a mentor for a little bit, and we, we rounded that corner to where now, now we're friends with this, with this mentor. Um, and, and I love, too, what he says about laying down one's life. You know, I, I think about this a lot. I think we've talked, we talked about this before where in some ways it would almost be easier to be like, oh, I'll take a bullet. I'll, I'll die a hero's death for someone. You know, like, of course, you have a family. Like, yeah, I would die for my family. But what, what would it look like to, to die a little bit every day in a good way for your family? You know, to, to lay down your agenda, to lay down your, um, your expectations, to lay down just the things that maybe need to be laid down and so for the health of the family. What if, we prune, what if we submitted ourselves and abided in the pruning for the overall health? To me, that's much more of a challenge than, yeah. than the, the daily, actual. Yeah, yeah, because that requires that consistent um, obedience and faithfulness. Yeah, it's so, really important. Yeah. And that is the movement to obedience. Yeah. Obedience to Jesus, the abiding life, means that we will obey him and and again go back to our triangle here uh, the father the the gardener Jesus the vine leads to our identity which brings about obedience Jesus actually says if you love me you'll keep my commands yeah. so one of the ways we describe Christianity is it's it's simple but it's not easy yeah following Jesus is simple but it's not easy because there's a tendency we can try to find our identity in what we do and so it's important to recognize our, what we do matters, but it's not our source of identity. Absolutely. This is why hearing God's voice is so important. When, early on, if you've been only following Jesus for a you know, few weeks, months, or maybe you just, you know, in that first year, it's really important to know the basics of what it means to follow him and to hear his voice. And maybe he's very specific with you. You stay connected to the scripture and, and, and community to disciple you. And, and as you grow in your faith, Continuing to hear his voice is really important so that we are obeying him in our lives and, yeah. and doing what he's calling us to, not, not what he's not calling us to. Right. And so that's why obedience is so important. Go ahead and share on what obedience is for you. Yeah, I mean, to me, again, I look at the scripture, obedience produces fruit. Um, and, and so what that looks like to me is, is you know, I, this week I was able to kind of look at, at that, do some studying on fruit. and. For first off, the uh, Greek word is karpos. So if you want to do play at home, nice job. say karpos. Thank you. Karpos. And, and what's interesting is throughout the Bible, there's a metaphor of fruit. You know, be fruitful is, is what, the, what God told Adam and Eve. Um, this isn't just that, like go and produce, you know, essentially humans. This is literal fruit as well. And so it's talking about this good fruit. And when we talk about good fruit in here, um, because this verse talks about good fruit and it talks about bad fruit. When we talk about good fruit, it, this is the, the fruits of the spirit. You know, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control, uh, all the things, patience, peace. That's what is produced in a life that is following Jesus. You, you see it wherever you go. And again, if you, if you look at a vine, I know we're kind of removed from like agrarian culture, but if you look at a vine, it's very evident what the fruit is. If you, look at a, if, you, if you look at my life, I want it to be evident who I am following and what is being produced. You know, 
I want a family where there is peace and there is patience, where there's gentleness and kindness. That, that's my hope as a parent. Yeah. You know, in, in my marriage, I want there to be, to be this a love and a forgiveness, a gentleness there. So what am I doing? How am I abiding well to make sure that that happens? You know, and bad fruit, let's talk about that for a second. Um, I don't know if you've ever let fruit go bad on your counter. Maybe, maybe we're the only ones who buy a bunch of fruit with the intention of like being really healthy. And then a week later, there's fruit, fruit flies. flies. <laughs> and it's gross. You know, um, thankfully, I've not eaten too much bad fruit. Um, but, but that can make you sick. Bad fruit is essentially, it's almost like poison. So if you are leading a life, if we're leading lives that are um, essentially poison, that are bad, the, the Father needs to remove that branch and needs to let us do our work to, to come back and figure out how to, how to find health, how to find growth in that. Um, and to me, it's, you know, it's, it's interesting because that trimming back is painful, but again, pruning comes with promise. There's the hope for tomorrow. There's a hope for better things if we are willing to let the Father do the work. Yeah, I, I even think about the season we find ourselves in, yeah. you know, a, as a nation and as in the world. Yeah. We are in what feels like a, a pruning season. Absolutely. Where it, it's interesting. I feel like we're, somebody said this to me the other day, we're all Sabbathing together. Yeah, uh, and, and grieving a little bit, but yeah, yes. Yeah, and almost like this extended Sabbath season in, in, in some ways. Not everyone. Certainly not, yeah. And, and so there's that, that line of in the pruning there is a promise. I'm really hanging on to that. This, this season of obedience will lead towards a, to a promise of great fruit. Like what's, yeah. what songs yeah. are going to get produced <clears throat> out of this season? Absolutely. What, I'm so excited in our community. Like oh, for sure. What songs will get produced? What art? What, what um, relational connections, depth? I'm yeah. seeing it in our family right oh, now. Totally. And, and I think sometimes we think that if we're in a pruning season, we've done something wrong you know, um, or, or that God, God's taking this away from me. You know, we expect to always be up and to the right. And, and if your life isn't always up and to the right, um, I would say it's not because you're doing it wrong, but it's because you're human. Like no organism is made to bloom or thrive 100% of the time. There are seasons that are for pruning and there are seasons that are, are for harvesting, that are seasons for growing. And so I think if we can embrace this idea of seasons, rather than just um, always expecting things to be up and to the right and always easy and always good and always producing. That's not realistic. That's not the, the value of um, the kingdom of God. You know, in Ecclesiastes 3, 1 and 2, it says there's a time for everything and every season uh, for, and a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot. That goes on for six more verses, talking about all the different seasons that there are. I, I am hopeful out of yeah. that out of this season, there will be a great amount of fruit that's produced. I'm super hopeful. I, I do. I feel like there's an invitation um, to, to see what fruit will outlast. When it, in that verse, it talks about how Jesus poured into the disciples and the fruit outlasted. Yeah. You know, and I, I wonder what that fruit is that will outlast this season. Yeah. The, the last piece to... Jesus being our true vine is, is practicing the, the presence, the moment we have with him in this present moment. And we've talked as a church about the, being a non-anxious presence. Yeah. And I want to share a story with you to, th to think about how we can abide, how we can um, stay connected to our, our father, the gardener, to Jesus as the vine, to find our identity. Yeah. It comes from each moment, each day, practicing the presence, being in the presence of God. Yeah. Yeah, and, and again, you may be like me where um, kind of being presence-minded doesn't come naturally. It, it's, for me, it's taken some work. Um, and w one thing that we talked about this week is there's, there's even an app called the Pause app where you can just pause throughout the day. It'll, it'll alert you and it gives you 60 seconds or if you kind of like level up, eventually you'll get to like three minutes or five minutes. But it, it, it gives you a moment to breathe, whether you feel like you're hanging on a rope or whether things are good, just to kind of reset and to be present in the moment and to be fully engaged with what's going on. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So as we close our time together this morning, we want to receive communion. And so I want, and I want to invite you right now to grab your elements. Um, you should have the cup and you should have uh, the bread. 
And um, as we move towards communion, what do we, how do we want to close out this time of, of what it looks like to abide, Court? What do you want to share with us? Yeah, I would just love to, to reflect a little bit, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, I wrote some thoughts down about, about this verse. Um, so this verse is not, this, I say verse, this passage, it's not about um, you living your best life by, by achieving or performing or behaving, but it's about choosing to be connected in responding to Jesus through God. Um, Jesus is turning things right side up. He's releasing us from the things that held us back that maybe we weren't even aware of. He is doing this um, by releasing his disciples from the trap of finding their identity in things that do not produce good fruit, and he's doing the same thing with us. Um, it, this is also letting the gardener do his best work. What if we chose to let the gardener do his best work in our lives? Not by striving, but by abiding and trusting the master gardener through each season, regardless of what it has to hold. Yeah, that's good. Thanks. So let's grab our elements now. Yeah. Thank you. And let's remember that as we receive this meal together, this is, this is us connecting to the true vine, that Jesus is the true vine of our lives. Jesus tells us this bread is his body broken for us. Let's take and eat together. And Jesus tells us this cup is his blood shed for you and shed for me, the new covenant. Let's take and drink together. Amen. Thank Amen. you, Jesus. Yeah. Would you please stand with us for the benediction for today in court? Did you have a did. prayer of blessing for us today? Yeah. May you go this week rooted in your identity, that your best work is choosing to abide in Jesus and letting the good gardener tend trim and care for you in every way this is not about our effort but it requires effort it is a choice and an invitation to a life that is full of growth fruit and joy amen amen grace and peace love you guys